Okay, tonight is the 14th of August, uh, 2011, and this is the second night we are speaking on the Udana, the third book of the Kudaka Nikaya. Tonight also happens to be the fifth full moon night, eh? so one month of Vasa has passed, uh, uh, less than two months more. Okay, now we come to chapter 3, Nandavaga, 3.1, Kamma Sutta. Thus have I heard, at one time the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, a certain monk was sitting cross-legged not far from the Lord, holding his body erect, mindful and clearly comprehending enduring without complaint feelings that were painful, acute, sharp and severe, the ripening of former karma. The Lord saw that monk sitting cross-legged not far away, enduring without complaint feelings that were painful, acute, sharp and severe, the ripening of former karma or action. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. A monk who has left behind all action or karma, shaking off the dust of former deeds, the stable one, unselfish, steady, has no need to address people. So this monk, eh, because of past uh, life karma, he was suffering eh, painful feelings. Eh. The next sutta is 3.2, Nanda Sutta. Thus have I heard, at one time, the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, the Venerable Nanda, the Lord's half-brother, the son of his maternal aunt, informed a number of monks thus, I am discontented with leading the holy life, friends. I am unable to endure the holy life. I will give up the training and return to the low life. Low life meaning uh, the lay life, uh. Then a certain monk approached the Lord, prostrated himself, sat down to one side and said, Venerable Nanda, revered sir, the Lord's half-brother, the son of his maternal aunt, informed a number of monks thus, I am discontented with leading the holy life, etc. I will give up the training and return to the low life. Then the Lord addressed a certain monk, Come monk, in my name tell the monk Nanda, the teacher calls you friend Nanda. Very well, revered sir, that monk replied, and approaching the venerable Nanda, he said, The teacher calls you friend Nanda. Very well, friend, the venerable Nanda replied, and approaching the Lord, he prostrated himself and sat down to one side. The Lord then said to him, Is it true, Nanda, that you inform a number of monks thus, I am discontented with leading the holy life, etc. I will return to the low life. And he said, Yes, revered sir. And the Buddha asked, But why, Nanda, are you discontented with leading the holy life? And he said, On departing from home, revered sir, a Sakyan girl, the loveliest in the land, with her hair half combed, looked up at me and said, May you, re <clears throat> May you return soon, master. Recollecting that, revered sir, I am discontented with leading the holy life. I am unable to endure the holy life. I will give up the training and return to the low life. Then the Lord took the Venerable Nanda by the arm, and just as a strong man might extend his flexed arm, or flex his extended arm, even so did they vanish from the Jeta wood and appear among the devas of the Tavatimsa heaven. Now on that occasion, about 500 pink-footed nymphs had come to minister to Saka, Devaraja, and the Lord said to the Venerable Nanda, Do you see those five hundred pink-footed nymphs? Yes, revered sir, he replied. And the Buddha said, What do you think, Nanda? Who is more beautiful, more fair to behold, and more alluring, that Sakyan girl, the loveliest in the land, or these five hundred pink-footed nymphs? And Nanda replied, Revered sir, compared to these five hundred pink-footed nymphs, that Sakyan girl, the loveliest in the land, it's like a mutilated she-monkey that, that has had its ears and nose chopped off. She does not count. She is not worth a fraction compared to them. There is no comparison. 
these 500 nims are far more beautiful, far more fair to behold and more alluring. And the Buddha said, Rejoice, Nanda, rejoice, Nanda. I guarantee you that you will obtain 500 pink-footed nims. And Nanda said, If revered, sir, the Lord guarantees that I will obtain 500 pink-footed nims, I shall be content in living the holy life under the Lord. Then the Lord took the venerable Nanda by the arm. Even so did they vanish from among the devas of the Tavatimsa heaven and appear in the Jeta wood. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, the Buddha is telling him, uh, if you continue uh, as a monk, uh, you practice the holy life, uh, when you pass away, uh, you will have these 500 devis uh, for your wives. Uh. So then he said, uh, if that's the case, uh, I will continue to lead the holy life. Uh. The monks heard, it is said that the Venerable Nanda, the Lord's half-brother, the son of his maternal aunt, is living the holy life for the sake of nims. They said that the Lord has guaranteed that he will obtain 500 pink-footed nims. Then the monk friends of the Nan Venerable Nanda went about calling him hireling and menial, saying, The Venerable Nanda is a hireling. The Venerable Nanda is a menial. He is living the holy life for the sake of nims. It is said that the Lord has guaranteed that he will obtain 500 pink-footed nims. Then the Venerable Nanda was humiliated, ashamed and dismayed by his friends calling him hireling and menial. Living alone, secluded, diligent, ardent and resolute, he soon realized even here and now, through his own direct knowledge, that unequal goal of the holy life, for the sake of which sons of good family rightly go forth from home to the homeless state, and entering into it, he abode in it. And he knew, finished his birth, lived is the holy life, done is what had to be done. There is no more of this state. And the venerable Nanda became one of the Arahants. And when the night was far advanced, a certain Devata of surpassing beauty, illuminating the whole Jeta wood, approached the Lord, prostrated himself and stood to one side. Standing there, that Devata said to the Lord, The venerable Nanda revered sir, the Lord's half-brother, the son of his maternal aunt, by the ending of the Asavas, has realized here and now, through his own direct knowledge, the taintless liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom, and entering into it, he abides in it. The knowledge also arose in the Lord, Nanda, by the ending of the Asavas, has realized here and now, the taintless Liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom, and entering into it, he abides in it. When that night had ended, the Venerable Nanda approached the Lord, prostrated himself, sat down to one side, and said to the Lord, Revered Sir, as to the Lord's guarantee that I will obtain five hundred pink-footed nymphs, I release the Lord from that promise. And the Buddha said, But Nanda, comprehending your mind with my mind, I knew Nanda has realized here and now the taintless liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom. Also a Devata told me, the Venerable Nanda revered sir, has realized here and now the taintless liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom. When Nanda, your mind was released from the Asavas without grasping, I was then released from that promise. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. That monk who has crossed the mire, crushed the thorn of sensual desire, and reached the destruction of delusion, is not perturbed by pleasures and pains. That's the end of the sutta. So here you see, eh, for anyone eh, to obtain liberation, eh, to destroy the cycle of birth and death, eh, is always to crush the thorn of sensual desire. Uh, it is a uh, sensual desire, meaning uh, the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, uh, basically, uh, and also sometimes uh, the mind uh, uh, objects. Uh, uh. So anything that we desire in the world, uh, that is the thing uh, that binds us uh, to samsara. Uh, so if we... I uh, want to get released from samsara. Uh, 
uh, anything that gives uh, delight uh, in the world, uh, the uh, person on the spiritual path uh, sees sees it as a danger, uh, is something not desirable. Uh, while worldly people will see it as desirable. Whatever worldly people see as desirable, uh, a person uh, seriously on the spiritual path uh, will see it as undesirable. Uh, just the opposite. Now we come to 3.3. Yaso Ja Sutta. Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, about 500 monks, headed by Yaso Ja, had arrived at Savati to see the Lord. As these incoming monks were exchanging greetings with the resident monks, and lodgings were being arranged, and bowls and robes put away, there was a loud noise, a great noise. Then the Lord addressed the verbal Ananda. Ananda, what is that loud noise, that great noise? It sounds like fishermen landing a catch of fish. And verbal Ananda said, About 500 monks headed by Yasuja, revered sir, have arrived at Savati to see the Lord. And as these incoming monks were exchanging greetings, etc., there was a loud noise, a great noise. And the Buddha said, well then, Ananda, in my name tell those monks, the teacher calls the verbal ones. Yes, revered sir, the verbal Ananda replied. And approaching those monks, he said, the teacher calls the verbal ones. Very well, friend, those monks replied to the verbal Ananda. And approaching the Lord, they prostrated themselves and sat down to one side. The Lord then said to those monks, Monks, why was there that loud noise, that great noise which sounded like fishermen landing a catch of fish? The verbal Yasoja replied, These five hundred monks, revered sir, have arrived at Savati to see the Lord. As these incoming monks were exchanging greetings, etc., there was a loud noise, a great noise. And the Buddha said, Go away, monks, I dismiss you. You ought not to stay near me. Very well, revered sir, those monks replied to the Lord. Then rising from their seats, they prostrated themselves before the Lord, keeping their right side toward him. Having set their lodgings in order and taking their bowls and robes, they departed on tour for the Vajji territory. Walking on tour by stages among the Vajis, they approached the river Vagumuda. And beside the river Vagumuda, they constructed leaf huts and commenced the rain's retreat. Stop here for a moment. Huh? You see, a lot of people think huh, during the Buddha's time, huh, the monks huh, do nothing except meditate. Huh? To, to stay in the kuti also, they have to build their own kuti. Huh? Hmm? They constructed leaf huts. That means uh, atap huts. Huh? Uh, and for the three months. Huh? Then the Venerable Yasoja addressed those monks who were commencing the rains retreat. Friends, the Lord dismisses us out of compassion, wishing our good wishing to benefit us, being compassionate. Come, friends, let us so abide that the Lord will be pleased with our way of living. Very well, friend, those monks replied to the Venerable Yasoja. And living secluded, diligent, ardent and resolute, those monks within that very range retreat all realized the three knowledges. Stop here for a moment. Huh? That means within the three months of the Vasa, huh? they attained the three knowledges. Huh? The first one is recollection of past lives. The second one is the uh, divine eye or heavenly eye, uh, which, which they use to see uh, beings uh, passing away and taking rebirth according to karma. And the third knowledge uh, is destruction of the asavas. Uh. And the Lord, having stayed at Savati as long as he wanted, departed on tour for Vesali. Walking on tour by stages, the Lord arrived at Vesali and stayed there near Vesali in the great wood in the hall of the gable house. Then the Lord, comprehending the mind of those monks beside the river Vagumuda with his mind, and having given consideration to it, addressed the venerable Ananda. This direction, Ananda, seems to me as if it has become light. This direction, Ananda, seems to me as if it has become radiant. It is agreeable for me to go and consider that direction, where those monks are staying beside the river, the river Vagumuda. Ananda, you should send a messenger to the monks beside the river Vagumuda to say, the teacher calls the venerable ones. The teacher wishes to see the venerable ones. Very well, revered sir, the venerable Ananda replied to the Lord. Approaching a certain monk, he said to him, 
Come friend, go to the monks beside the river Vagumuda and tell them, the teacher calls the venerable ones, the teacher wishes to see the venerable ones. Very well friend, that monk replied to the venerable Ananda. Then just as a strong man might extend his flexed arm, or flex his extended arm, even so did he vanish from the hall of the gable house in the great wood and appear before those monks beside the river Vagumuda. He said to them, The teacher calls the venerable ones. The teacher wishes to see the venerable ones. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So this venerable Ananda went to, went to get this monk huh, who has psychic power huh, uh, to go and contact those monks beside the river of Agumuda. Huh? Uh, so the, the monk just vanished from this Vesali and appeared there huh, and passed the message to them. Huh? Very well, friend, those monks replied, that having set their lodgings in order and taking the bowls and ropes, just as a strong man might extend his flex arm or flex his extended arm, etc., even so did they vanish from beside the river Vagumuda and appear before the Lord in the great wood in the hall of the gable house. At that time, the Lord was sitting in imperturbable concentration. Then those monks thought, in what state is the Lord now abiding? And those monks thought, the Lord is abiding in the state of imperturbability, and they too all sat in imperturbable concentration. Stop here for a moment. Eh? Imperturbable concentration refers to the fourth jhana and the arupas. Eh? The first three jhanas eh, are still perturbable, still bole goyang, eh? uh, not so uh, strong. Eh? But the fourth eh, is unshakable, eh? imperturbable. Then when the night was far advanced and the first watch had ended, the Venerable Ananda rose from his seat, arranged his robe over one shoulder, raised his folded hands and said to the Lord, The night is far advanced, revered sir. The first watch has ended, that means 10 p.m. And the incoming monks have been sitting for a long time. Revered sir, let the Lord greet the incoming monks. And this was said, the Lord remained silent. When the night was still further advanced and the middle watch had ended, that means 2 a.m., the second time the member Ananda arose from his seat and said to the Lord, The night is far advanced, revered sir. The middle watch has ended and the incoming monks have been sitting for a long time. Revered sir, let the Lord greet the incoming monks. For a second time the Lord remained silent. When the night was yet further advanced and the last watch had ended, that means 6 a.m., when dawn was approaching and the night was drawing to a close, a third time the Venerable Ananda arose from his seat and said to the Lord, The night is far advanced, revered sir. The last watch has ended. Dawn is approaching and the night is drawing to a close. The incoming monks have been sitting for a long time. Revered sir, let the Lord greet the incoming monks. Then the Lord emerged from that concentration and addressed the Venerable Ananda. If you knew Ananda, he would not speak in such a way. These five hundred monks and I, Ananda, have all been sitting in imperturbable concentration. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. Who has mastered the thorn of sensual desire, abuse, punishment, imprisonment? That monk stands steady as a mountain, desireless, not perturbed by pleasures and pains. Next sutta, 3.4. Sariputta sutta. Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood in Anatha Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, the Venerable Sariputta was sitting cross-legged, not far from the Lord, holding his body erect, having set up mindfulness before him. The Lord saw the Venerable Sariputta sitting cross-legged, not far away, holding his body erect having set up mindfulness before him. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. Just as a mountain made of solid rock stands firm and unshakable, even so, when delusion is destroyed, a monk like a mountain is not perturbed. 3.5 Mahamoglana Sutta Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood, at Anatta Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, the Venerable Mahamoglana was sitting cross-legged, not far from the Lord, 
holding his body erect, having mindfulness with, with regard to the body well established within him. The Lord saw the Venerable Maha Mogalana sitting cross-legged not far away, holding his body erect, having mindfulness with regard to the body well established within him. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance, with mindfulness of the body established, controlled over contact sixfold base, a monk who is always concentrated can know Nibbana for himself. 3.6. Belinda Vacha Sutta Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying near Rajagaha in the bamboo wood at the squirrel's feeding place. On that occasion, the Venerable Pilinda Vacha went about calling the monks outcasts. Stop here for a moment. Eh? This outcast eh, is the lowest eh, of society. In India, eh, they have four castes. Eh? Uh, the uh, Katya, the warrior caste, the Brahmin caste. Katya is supposed to be higher, eh, although the Brahmins think that they are higher. Eh? The second is the Brahmins. The third is the uh, Vesas, the merchants. The fourth is the Sudas, the worker class. La. So these outcasts, uh, they are so low, uh, they are out of these four castes. La, uh. So a monk is also an outcast. La. A monk is, <laughs> has no caste. Uh, uh. So, um, so this uh, Plinda Vacha, uh, he, he liked to call all the other monks uh, outcasts. La. Uh, to put it roughly, uh, in our Malaysian language, uh, pariya, la. <laughs> pariya. Mm. Now, a number of monks approached the Lord, prostrated themselves, sat down to one side and told him, Revered Sir, the Venerable Pilinda Vacha is going about calling the monks outcasts. Then the Lord addressed a certain monk, saying, Come, monk, in my name tell the monk Pilinda Vacha, the teacher calls you friend Pilinda Vacha. Very well, revered Sir. That monk replied to the Lord, and approaching the Venerable Pilinda Vacha, he said, The teacher calls you friend. Very well, friend, the Venerable Pilinda Vacha replied, and approaching the Lord, he prostrated himself and sat down to one side. The Lord then said to the Venerable Pilinda Vacha, Is it true, Vacha, that you go about calling the monks outcasts? Yes, revered sir. Then the Lord, on giving consideration to Pilinda Vacha's former lives, addressed the monks, do not be irritated, monks, with the monk Vacha. It is not with inner hatred that Vacha goes about calling the monks outcasts. For five hundred births without interruption, the monk Vacha has been born in the Brahmin caste, and thus for a long time he has been habituated to calling others outcasts. It is because of this that Vacha goes about calling the monks outcasts. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance, In whom there is neither fraud nor, dis nor conceit, who is without greed, unselfish, desireless, with anger quelled, his mind quenched. He is a brahmana, he is a recluse, he is a monk. Ah, that's the end of the sutta. So this monk, Aplinda Vacha, he is already an arahana. So when the Buddha uh, read his mind, uh, knew uh, that he had no hate. La. This, there's been a Brahmin. You know, these Brahmins, they look down on other castes. Uh, they have this uh, habit of looking down on other castes, uh, calling ad other castes uh, 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 dark-footed uh, offsprings uh, from Brahma's feet. Uh. So, because of habit. Uh, uh. Okay, anything to discuss the last six sutta? No need to talk to people. I mean, say Arahan. He doesn't do any karma anymore. Has left behind all karma. Doesn't do any karma anymore no? because he has no self. No? And shaking off the dust of former. Kama is Kama. Uh, he has no need to talk to people. Okay, to continue, uh, 3.7, Kasapa Sutta. 
Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying near Rajagaha in the bamboo wood at the squirrel's feeding place. On that occasion, the venerable Mahakasapa was staying in the Pipali cave, sitting cross-legged for seven days, having attained a certain state of concentration. Then at the end of those seven days, the venerable Mahakasapa emerged from that concentration. After emerging, the venerable Mahakasapa thought, What if I should enter Rajagaha for alms food? At that time, 500 devatas were busily preparing alms food for the venerable Mahakasapa. But having refused the offerings of those 500 devatas, the venerable Mahakasapa robed himself in the forenoon, that means in the morning, and taking his bowl and outer robe, entered Rajagaha for alms food. On that occasion, Sakha Devaraja, wishing to give alms food to the venerable Mahakasapa, assumed the appearance of a weaver, weaving at a loom, while Suja, the Asura maiden, filled the shuttle. Now the venerable Mahakasapa, walking for alms food in Rajagaha on an uninterrupted alms round, that means uh, house to house, lah, not missing any house, lah, came to the dwelling of Sakha Devaraja, Seeing the venerable Mahakasapa coming from afar, Saka Devaraja came out of the house and went to meet him. Taking the bowl from his hand and going into the house, he took bald rice from a pot, filled the bowl and gave it to the venerable Mahakasapa. And this arms food included various kinds of curry, various kinds of sauce, curry of various kinds of excellent tastes and flavors. Then the venerable Mahakasapa thought, who is this being who has such supernormal potency and power? Then the venerable Mahakasapa thought, Is it not Saka Devaraja? Realizing it was, he said, This is your doing, Kosia. Do not do such a thing again. Kosia is uh, one of the names of Saka Devaraja. And Saka said, We too need merit, revered Kasapa. We too should make merit. Then Saka Devaraja, having prostrated himself to the venerable Mahakasapa, keeping his right side towards him, rose into the air. While suspended in the sky, three times he uttered this inspired utterance, Ah, the best alms giving on Kasapa, alms is well donated. The Lord, with divine hearing, purified and surpassing that of humans, heard Saka Devaraja suspended in the sky, uttering three times this inspired utterance. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. The devas hold dear such a monk who collects his food on arms round, self-sufficient, supporting no other, who is calm and ever mindful. This Mahakasapa is a very uh, ascetic monk. Uh, He's, even though uh, he's, he's supposed to be much older than the Buddha. La. And then when the Buddha was uh, nearly 80 years old, la, or 80 years old, la, Mahakasapa was much older. La, and uh, he was still staying in the forest, la, alone staying in the forest. La. You know, staying in the forest la, in the winters, la, it's very cold. La. Uh, so the Buddha invited him to come and stay in the monastery. He said, no. He said for two reasons. He said one is uh, uh, he finds uh, it uh, uh, pleasant to stay alone in the forest. Secondly, he said out of compassion for future future generations uh, of people uh, to let people know a real uh, uh, good monk who stay alone in the forest. So the devas like to uh, do dana on him uh, because he's a uh, arahan. Uh, and also because they admire him la, for being so ascetic. Uh, so 500 devatas want to offer him refuge. He knew that they were devas, he refused to accept. La. So this deva, Saka Devaraja, have to pretend to be a human being, la, took the form of a human being. Uh, this uh, weaver, weaver, you know, during the, during the Buddha's time, uh, they are not so lucky like nowadays, we can get cloth anytime we want. For them, uh, they have to make cloth. La. So this uh, Suja is the wife, la, the daughter of the Asura king. La. The, the wife uh, was, uh, what do you call it, uh, filling the shuttle, that means uh, feeding the tread. Uh, feeding the tread, uh, then he was making the, the cloth. La. Uh, so he pretended to come out la, and offer food to, to the Mahakasapa. Mm -hmm. 
3.8 Arms Food Collector Pindapatika Sutta Thus have I heard At one time the Lord was staying near Rajagaha in the Jeta Wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery On that occasion, after the meal on returning from collecting arms food a number of monks had gathered together in the Kareri Tree Pavilion when this topic of conversation arose An arms food collecting monk friends while walking for arms food from time to time gets to see agreeable forms with the eye. From time to time gets to hear agreeable sounds with the ear. From time to time gets to smell agreeable odors with the nose. From time to time gets to taste agreeable flavors with the tongue. From time to time gets to touch agreeable tangible objects with the body. An arms food collecting monk, friends, when he walks for arms food, is respected, revered, honored, venerated and given homage. Come, rent, come friends, let us all be arms food collectors, and we too from time to time will get to see agreeable forms to the eye, etc. And we too will be respected, revered, honored, venerated, and given homage when we walk for arms food. And this conversation of those monks continued without coming to an end. Then the Lord, emerging from seclusion in the evening, went to the Kareri tree pavilion and sat down on the seat prepared for him. Sitting there, the Lord asked the monks, What were you talking about just now, monks, while gathered here together? What was the topic of discussion that you had left unfinished? And they said, After the meal, revered sir, on returning from collecting arms food, we had gathered here in the Kareri Tree Pavilion when this topic of conversation arose. An arms food collecting monk, friends, while walking for arms food, from time to time gets to see agreeable forms with the eye, etc., uh, and, we, and we too will be respected, revered, etc. when we walk for arms food. This revered sir was our discussion that was left unfinished when the Lord arrived. And the Buddha said, It is not right, monks, that you sons of good family who have gone forth out of faith from home to the homeless state should talk on such a topic. When you have gathered together, monks, you should do one of two things, either engage in talk on Dhamma, or maintain noble silence. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. The Devas hold dear such a monk who collects his food on arms round, self-sufficient, supporting no other, but not if he is intent on praise and fame. Uh, so the Devas uh, uh, respect uh, a monk uh, uh, who collects his arms food uh, to practice the holy life. Uh. But if he thinks uh, he wants to uh, be an uh, arms food gatherer uh, just to get praise and fame, uh, then the devas will not respect him. Uh. Just like these monks were talking about, uh, we, we go on in the Pata, uh, people will respect us. Uh. 3.9 Sipa Sutta Thus have I heard at one time, the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, a number of monks had gathered together in the Kareri tree pavilion when this topic of conversation arose. Who, friend, knows a craft? Who is trained in what craft? Which craft is the chief of crafts? Herein some said, elephant craft is the chief of crafts. Some said, horsemanship is the chief of crafts. Some said, chariot craft. Some said archery, swordsmanship, communicating by gestures, accountancy, mathematics, the art of writing, the art of poetry, the art of debate, political science is a chief of crafts, etc. And this conversation of those monks continued without coming to an end. Then the Lord, emerging from seclusion in the evening, went to the Kareri Tree Pavilion, and similarly he rebuked the monks. It is not right, monks, that you should talk on such a topic, when you have gathered together monks, you should do one of two things, either engage in talk on Dhamma or maintain noble silence. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance, Who lives by no craft, unburdened, desiring the goal, with restrained faculties, wholly released, wandering homeless, unselfish, desireless, conceit abandoned, solitary, he is a monk. The Buddha said uh, a monk uh, should uh, wander homeless, etc., uh, and have no craft. Uh. 
3.10 examining uh, this is loka volokana sutta examining the world thus have i heard at one time the lord was staying at uruvela beside the river naranjara at the foot of the bodhi tree having just realized full enlightenment at that time the lord sat cross legged for seven days experiencing the bliss of liberation then at the end of those seven days the lord emerged from that concentration and examined the world with the buddha eye while examining the world with the buddha eye the lord saw beings tormented by various torments and consumed by various feverish longings born of passion hatred and delusion then on realizing its significance the lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance the world is subject to torment afflicted by contact it calls a disease self for however it is conceived it is ever otherwise than that becoming something other the world is held by being is afflicted by being yet delights in being by what but what it delights in brings fear and what it fears is suffering now this holy life is lived in order to abandon being whatever recluses and Br- brahmins have said that freedom from being comes about through some kind of being none of them i say are free from being and whatever recluses and brahmins have said that escape from being comes about through non being none of them i say have escaped from being this suffering arises dependent upon clinging with the ending of all grasping or attachment no suffering is produced look at the people in the world afflicted by ignorance come into being delighting in being not free whatever forms of being exist in any way anywhere all these forms of being are impermanent subject to suffering of a nature to change on seeing this as it actually is with perfect wisdom the craving for being is abandoned yet one does not delight in non being nibbana is total dispassion and cessation attained with the complete destruction of cravings among whose cravings are extinguished by not grasping as no renewal of being mara is vanquished the battle is won the stable one has passed beyond all forms of being this being a bhava refers to uh the i am uh when you think i am or i exist uh, then the a being comes into the, into existence so sometimes <clears throat> the word bhava is translated as being or becoming or existence uh, in chinese it is you la you anything to discuss before we go to the next chapter is aiming to get out of the cycle of rebirth la but he may not get it immediately might be a few lifetimes mm. no no uh once you attain super mundane merit that means uh, you become uh, you attain one of the stages of aryahood la that is not reversible hm uh if one does not attain one of the aryan stages ha uh, then uh, uh you will still uh, go on this endless round of birth and death la uh, and you may not meet the dhamma in your next life but if you have attained uh, uh even the lowest level of uh, aryahood na uh, see the first path la the first path na uh, before the person dies na uh, you will turn to fruit na when you attain path na uh, before you die you must turn to fruit na and then uh, uh then the even the lowest la uh, the sotapanna 
he has maximum of seven more lifetimes, la. seven more births. La. That's the maximum. La. Uh, and uh, he won't be reborn in the three woeful planes of existence. La. He'll only come back as a human being or as a heavenly being. La. <clears throat> and uh, even if he comes back as a human being, uh, he will have a lot of blessings. La. He will have a good life. La. So the amount of uh, suffering left is very little once you become an Arya. But if you have not become an Arya, the amount of suffering uh, is uncountable because uh, you don't know when you're going to come out of samsara. <clears throat>